really excited to be here and tell you about some of the work we've been doing using direct RNA sequencing to do quality control of some lentiviral gene therapy vectors. Um, so I'll just start with a little bit of background. Um, Lentiviruses are a type of single-stranded RNA virus. And in the context of gene therapy, they're really interesting because they can integrate into the genome and stably express a construct of interest. Um, the lentiviral gene therapy process can basically be divided into two parts. The first one being production, and then the rest of it being the integration. Today, we'll mostly just focus on the production, though. Um, and in particular, we'll talk about how we can QC the production process by sequencing the RNA from the packaged virus. And this is something that's really important because one of the common problems in um, lentiviral gene therapy production is incomplete vector RNA. Um, as you would imagine, this definitely reduces the efficacy of the gene therapy because if you're missing important parts like part of the transgene or the promoter even, you can, like, yeah, just imagine that that's not going to have a therapeutic effect for the patient. Um, and there are a number of different potential causes that have been identified in the literature um, for incomplete lentiviral RNA. And these include things like splicing, insufficient processivity of the RNA polymerase, and usage of cryptic poly A signals. And so because there are so many different potential causes, um, it's really important that we have an assay that can not only measure how much RNA is incomplete, but also tell us why, so that we can go on to address these things. And we really feel that long read sequencing is the ideal kind of approach to tackle this, but there wasn't really much out there in the literature um, on the topic, so we wanted to start by comparing three different um, sequencing approaches. And the results of that are just summarised in this plot. So in the green colour, I just plotted the sequencing coverage for each of the three technologies. And then that's just against the vector reference sequence at the bottom there. Um, and so uh, basically what we expect to see is the coverage decaying as you move from the three prime to five prime end of the vector, just because depending on the technology, that's the end where either the reverse transcription or the sequencing is starting from. Um, but what we're really interested in is sharp changes in the vector coverage, just like that one you can see about a third of the way through the vector within the transgene. Um, and that to us indicates that there's some kind of um, isoform of truncated RNA that's occurring like at that particular point. You might notice at the bottom panel, the cDNA sequencing looks a bit different. And that's just because um, these vectors are really long and so they have a lot of internal poly A tracts. And so we had a bit of an issue with um, internal priming during the reverse transcription. And that wasn't really ideal because like, we can't distinguish between internally primed transcripts and um, actual truncated lentiviral RNAs. So for that reason, we selected direct RNA as our method of choice because it gave us a really good number of reads per sample, as well as a um, pretty like unbiased, or at least as unbiased as we could get, look at what was actually going on with our lentiviral RNAs. So with that in mind, we applied it to our collaborators' um, vectors of interest, which are designed to treat a condition called Whisker-Aldrich syndrome. Um, and these are four different vectors. They're like four slight variations on the same vector design. They all just have some um, mutations in the insulator region in order to try and prevent splicing. You might notice that these plots look a lot cleaner than the ones on the previous slide, and that's just because these vectors have undergone a lot of optimization already, so they don't have too many problems left. But still, we can observe a sharp change in coverage around about two-thirds of the way into the vector. And so to try and understand what's causing this, we overlay some additional information on the plot. And what I've just added in this orange color is um, the location of the three prime ends of the reads. So if you see a peak, that means a lot of reads are ending at that location. Um, we see a peak right at the like, three prime end, which is um, reads that terminate at the end of the vector as they should. But we also see a small um, orange peak coinciding with that sharp coverage change. So that leads us to think that um, you know, rather than something like splicing, for example, these reads actually are terminating at that location, so the RNAs are terminating at that location. So it might be due to something like a cryptic poly A site, for example. And actually, when we look at the sequence around that location, we find a non-canonical poly A site motif. Um, 
And depending on the sample, this accounts for around about 3 to 5% of the reads. So not a huge amount, but still nice that we can detect something like this. Um, we did also look at the splicing. Um, it's a bit hard to see because there's just very little splicing going on. Less than 1.5% of the reads in total were spliced, um, which I guess we kind of expect, seeing these vectors have been specifically modified to prevent splicing. Um, but what was really interesting was what happened when we artificially polyadenylated our reads, uh, our RNAs prior to sequencing. Um, because like up until this point, we've only been sequencing those RNAs with a natural poly-A tail. And so we wanted to know, is there anything going on in the non-polyadenylated um, kind of group of RNAs? And as you can see, we identified two new isoforms of truncated RNAs. So this first one here was responsible for almost 9% of the reads. Um, and it's located within a short hairpin RNA that's encoded in the vector to try to select for transduced cells. The second one there is um, about 11% of the reads, and that's located in the stem and loop region, which is like a highly structured part of the lentivirus. That's um, like it comes from the HIV, and it's really important for the lentivirus's function. Um, so we thought it was pretty interesting that both of these seem to occur within hairpins, and we wondered if maybe they're places where either the RNA polymerase is having some difficulty with the structure or potentially maybe um, the RNA is being cut by an enzyme like Drosha, for example, that would exist within the producer cells. Um, but yeah, it was quite surprising and made up a pretty big chunk of our reads. Um, so using the results of these experiments, we can kind of summarize and try to quantify how much of our RNA was actually complete versus not. Um, we can't put an exact number on how much is normal because we can't tell the difference between RNA degradation and incomplete RNA um, polymerase processivity, although we probably assume that RNA degradation is a, like a bigger contributor, and so the percentage of normal reads is probably closer to 75%. Um, but still, it gives us a good indication of what we might want to address when we try to optimise our vectors. Um, but before we optimised our vectors, we also wanted to try see if we could optimise the um, like assay a little bit more. So what we did was we swapped out the superscript 3, that's part of the standard protocol, for the enduro reverse transcriptase. And this um, gives us much better coverage down at the 5 prime end. So what you can see here is the exact same RNA, just split in two and like prepped in parallel. Um, and we just used the enduro out of the box. We didn't really have any time to optimise it or anything. Um, and yeah, it makes a really big difference and it just helps us, like we could detect the splicing patterns at the 5 prime end before with the superscript 3, but with the enduro, it's just so much easier to see, you know, we can see that nice clean chunk taken out of the coverage plot. Um, and yeah, we really recommend it if you have some long RNAs that you want to sequence. Um, so using this method, we then applied it to two optimised vector designs. Um, they both have that short hairpin RNA cassette removed. And then the second one there, number 371, we made a um, point mutation to try to correct what we thought was that cryptic poly A site. Um, unfortunately, that didn't really have the desired effect. Um, we do need to do some more replicates of this. Um, but it, while it reduced the percentage of reads terminating in that location, it didn't drop it down to zero. So we wonder if maybe there's something else going on there that, um, yeah, we're not quite sure. But what was really surprising was this new splicing pattern that we identified. Um, it makes up a pretty massive percentage of our reads. Um, and it is something that, so those spliced donor and acceptor sites have always been in the vector. They're in all the previous vectors I showed you, but never once did we actually see them used, not even in one single read, until we took out the hairpin cassette, which is in very close proximity, and all of a sudden, in, we've got, done about 20 samples by long read and short read, and this splicing pattern is always observed. Um, we have no idea why. We wonder maybe like something in the cassette, possibly the hairpin itself, was sterically hindering the splicing from happening. Um, but to us, that really just showed the importance of sequencing. Because these vectors are so long and so complex, when we make changes, we can't predict what the effect is going to be. So we need to sequence it in order to actually like, know what's going to happen. 
Um, yeah, so just to quickly sum up, hopefully I've shown you that nanopore direct RNA sequencing is a really powerful approach for quality control of lentiviral gene therapy vectors, but also just any lentivirus in general, especially with the increased throughput of the new RNA004. Like the cost is kind of coming down to the point where you could probably start to sequence the lentiviruses used in the lab routinely. And um, we're starting to sequence some lentiviruses used for CAR T cell production, for example. Um, and using the direct RNA sequencing, we're able to find cryptic splice and poly A sites, as well as hairpin associated truncations in our vectors. And the Enduro RT really helps us to get a better understanding of what's going on at the five prime end. Um, we tried optimizing our vectors with this um, information, but we found out it was a lot more difficult than we previously thought. So we really recommend sequencing, and we're going to be sequencing every new vector design from now on. And yeah, I just need to thank everyone who's been involved. And we do have a preprint um, if you want more information.